Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. It's time for Comics Revisited. Today we're revisiting Friendo. That's right, everybody. Welcome here to Pop Culture Philosophers. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is... Brian Weaver. And we are going to be revisiting Friendo today. That's right, the Vault comic book Friendo. Got a trade paperback collection of it right here. We'll throw a link down below so you can get you one yourself. Nice, shiny, beautiful plastic and real. Fake plastic trees and all that stuff. Anyway, we're going to be talking about Friendo. That's right. It's from Vault Comics. It's a recent addition into the comic book canon, right? It just wrapped up this year, but we definitely think it's worth revisiting. Vault Comics does exceptional work. This book is written by Alex Packnadel. Alex Packnadel got his start. His first comic book was Arcadia. Have you read that one yet? I have it. It's so good. I haven't read it yet. Though. His first comic book was amazing. He met Martin Simmons, who is a, a, a an illustrator. He worked on books like Punk's Not Dead, for instance, over at IDW Black Crown. And they met at, like, right as Arcadia was coming out, they met at some kind of comic convention in England, right? And they they, they kind of wanted to do this book. They, were, they had been talking about this book. It was already in development, right? But then he went on to do Turncoat from Boom Studios, another excellent book. Um, if you've never read those, it's absolutely fantastic. If you have read Friendo, it's amazing, and you definitely deserve to check out Alex's previous work. So Alex and Martin had decided they wanted to do this book, and then when White Noise made their deal with Vault, that's right, White Noise is a writing studio, like a writer's collective, um, a bunch of uh, um, Englandites. <laughs> One. I think that's right. Um, yeah, but Alex is part of this group with Dan Waters, Ryan O'Sullivan, Rom V, fantastic creators. They came in, made this deal with Vault, and it set up that they were each going to do their own five-issue series. Alex's series, of course, was Friendo. So the book is only five issues, um, published by Vault. It's like a sci-fi dystopian warning about consumerism and capitalism and all kinds of crazy stuff all wrapped up in one. Brian, I know you love this book. Why don't you tell us what you love about it so much? Oh, uh, there's a lot to love about this. Um, yeah, the themes you were touching on, uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's all relevant stuff to today's world. I mean, you know, it's the, uh, you know, you can see where, you know, what unethical capitalism leads to, you know, what we're currently experiencing, the the never ending, uh, the never ending need to satisfy our desires uh, with um, stuff yeah. that doesn't really end up making us happy, which that's one of my favorite scenes in this. Guilty. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you know, like it even covers on how, you know, the mass, can, you know, the corporations come in you know, sell their things to the town that they're going to bring in all these jobs and then they automate everything away, you know, tear all these jobs down. I mean, it's all really relevant stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, one thing I was thinking is it was uh, on the subject of the being happy and things like that. I, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any happy characters in this whole book. I mean, you know, I mean, there's some people I think that are <laughs> maybe slightly satisfied with their stuff, but they're evil people. Do you think the cream cremators a happy person? This is the happiest day of my life. <laughs> yeah, but if you looked at that, that's one. Of, that's what I was talking about. Actually, that's yeah. one of my favorite pages. Is four panels. They're all you know widescreen panels of him at Disney World and on like he's at Haunted Mansion, the you know the water ride or whatever. And every shot is like face, like his face is in the middle. Like, yeah, it's it's this. really I good. Mean, it's like that's a good point, Brian, because you, nobody in this <clears> book is happy, and I think that Alex and and company did this on purpose. Yeah. You know, because this is a book that's trying to explain what it's like once everybody realizes that this myth we've been sold of happiness isn't necessarily true for everyone. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, and we could definitely paint the book as it's some, some kind of really highbrow, pretentious, intellectual book, which yeah. I think is incredibly... I think Alex Pacnadel is one of the most intelligent writers I've ever, ever come across, man. I mean, I'm not down downplaying anybody else's intelligence in comics, but Alex is an incredibly intelligent man mm -hmm. and it really comes across especially when you follow him like on twitter and i adore following alex on twitter he's a, such a fantastic cat Absolutely. um but the book itself is also just a really fun violent buddy movie vi like romp you know yeah. what i'm saying it's really really crazy the basic premise of the book is that it's in it's set in a, a version of, L of la that's not too far away from where we possibly are right now right there's 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 marketing everywhere in fact this law just got passed where it basically said that 
the entire environment is open game for marketing and just by existing on this world you give your consent to being a part of it you know mm -hmm. leo who is the main character in this book his job because he moved to la he wants to be an actor he's trying to chase that dream and at the beginning of the book he's doing these like stunts for like this like I don't know, guerrilla marketing or something, some kind of Fast and Furious movie. He's yeah. wrecking cars, and they're, they're trying to get more dangerous. He's like, I don't get paid if I don't make it on the news. He's shacking up with this very successful woman in L.A. He feels inadequate, right? She's been buying him gifts. One thing I love about that is that when she gives him the gifts of the glasses, the glaze glasses that come with the Frendo app, so it formulates a a VR buddy for you based on just a few weird random Very questions. Very weird questions. Picks out a personality profile. This dude shows up. He's just trying to sell you things, right? Yeah. It's like the, what were they, Google Glasses, the Google Lens, yeah. whatever it was. Mm -hmm. It's something kind of like that. And Alex said in an interview I read, when he first heard about the, the Google Lens glasses or whatever, he was like, well, how are they going to integrate marketing in there? To him, it would make more sense, he said, if they actually had somebody sitting there being like, hey, Arby's coupons for 10% off, you know? Like, Let's yeah. go get some roast beef. I can get us a deal, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's kind of this, like, you know, swarmy kind of character, you know? And, and he's based on... And the friendo is going to be based on your own thing, right? Um, so he puts on these glasses. They're a gift from this woman. And I love when she gives him the gift. He goes, I told you, you don't have to do this stuff. She goes, but it makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. Even the idea nowadays in this, in this, in this hyper-consumerism, hyper-fake-happy world that we live in this hyper fake world it's like that's the joy in giving no i enjoy giving you a gift like i know it yeah. makes you feel like crap i know you've asked me not to do it but i'm going to keep doing it because it makes me feel good right. i don't know but i don't know that's i digress anyway so he gets these glasses he's out there he's dressed up as the tin man from the wizard of oz he's dancing at a club but there's this big there's like wildfires going on so there's this giant dust cloud out in la and it's dangerous and so there's not anything going on so they send him home and in the middle of all this, he gets his one of his friends has an asthma attack. He gets separated from his group, and this homeless guy shows up. And it's an interesting the homeless guy. That's an interesting interaction that they have because he's there's a lot of like cool wordplay and stuff, especially in this scene. And it really like gets to the heart, I think, about what the book is going to be about. Anyway, the homeless guy attacks him, yeah. right? And then he uh, his he's like there's like a live wire or something in the storm that comes up and it fries mm -hmm. leo puts him in a coma but in doing so it erases the ethical parameters yeah. of the friendo app so now you know it, you know it's all fair game so at this point now his life is hitting the spiral he comes out of a coma he's he's getting heavier he's growing a beard out he's not paying attention to the people around him he's just engrossed in this friendo app but it's only working. Jerry is the name of his friendo. And Jerry will only come around and chat with him when there's actual purchase intent. Purchase intent. Yeah. Purchase intent. That's of course, this term. dude has no money. So he's wrecking his life. He's wrecking his relationship. Doing all these kind of things to, to get that next fix. And literally at this point, especially because he feels so abandoned and neglected by his friends from them leaving him in that storm. Yeah. Albeit because this one dude's like dying, literally dying. Yeah. Of course, Leo winds up literally almost dying too. Anyway, so then it all comes around. Um, uh, so he doesn't have money, so he can't do anything. And then he gets this idea, and maybe the idea is implanted to him by Jerry, that maybe he can just start robbing these stores. And mm -hmm. that will bring his friend back. Because he actually, it's all he has. And as the book progresses, especially by the end of it, Brian, all that Leo has is Jerry, right? What right. do you think about that? Well, yeah, that's, uh, to me, one of those themes was the lack of connection that we have, the, like, you know, the further along we get down into, you know, this technology, you know, or social media and certain things like that, but, you know, a lack of actual genuine connection, mm -hmm. which he has throughout the entire book. I mean, he was uh, his girlfriend who, you know, yeah, she was, you know, you could say she was kind of being selfish by giving him gifts because it makes her feel good, but she was like genuinely interested in his welfare too. Yes. You know, I mean, like they were, you know, doing stuff and the thing and he couldn't even pay attention because he was so consumed about being on the news and she was just like, you know, right there trying to be connected with him and he wasn't even, he didn't really care. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, it didn't, it didn't mean a, a thing to him. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, when they ran into the buddies that abandoned him in that storm, uh, you know, the, uh, Jerry, you know, killed him, right? He killed that one dude. He killed that dude. Yeah. And so like for some By reason, the way, Leo, there will be spoilers if you, I mean, you should yeah, know that by now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so Leo 
I think Leo thinks that's like a connection, like a gen that that partly solidifies his genuine connection with with Jerry because he's looking out for him, you know, and he yeah. sees things the same way he does. When he, he has uh, that conversation, he was so angry with that guy, even yeah. though the guy explained what happened. You know, he was still just incredibly angry. But I did. I mean, to me, like this was my second read of it. You know, prior to doing this, and and I I, I caught a lot more stuff. I loved it. I mean, oh yeah, I, I loved it a lot more the second go around. Um, it, it definitely, but, re, re, yeah, it definitely rewards repeated. Yeah, watches, watches, but, reads. Yeah, but I was thinking that that dust storm and everything like that was basically the tornado from Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it's, it's got a lot of from, Wizard of Oz know, connection. Um, Apparently, a little bit of grapes of wrath is and, thrown in there. And the name of the club is called Eschaton, mm-hmm. uh, which is another word for the apocalypse. Oh, interesting. So, if you ever end up reading the Illuminati trilogy. Yeah, you know they go over that a lot. Okay, you know? so just just pointing that out. But okay, but I I really that that lack of connection like really stood out to me through I mean throughout the entire book. You know I mean I just thought it was uh, you know it is a you know it is a hallmark you know becoming a hallmark of our culture. Yeah, you know and uh, but yeah it's uh, um, yeah in the, in the art in those areas where that storm was you know and then he gets stabbed and then he gets shocked and then when he's coming back and those like the that was really striking, you know, because yeah. it just, you know, it's like a full panel on the last page of the first issue. Then the second thing, it's like, he's coming to with all that stuff. Yeah. And it's gorgeous. It's yeah. one of the coolest, you know, uh, another know, really cool sequence. thing is, is yeah. When his, <clears throat> when his, when his girlfriend is, is trying to help him out. And when he's getting in that argument with her, he mentions that like to him, Jerry's the only person that's there for him. Right. He saved yeah. my life. Yeah. You know, and then it happens again when Jerry takes the bullet from her. From him, yeah, and he winds up with that hole inside of him, and yeah. I, I think that I'm sure that there's a visual theme there, right? That there's something empty about this, yeah. You know, it's not whole. Well, and you know, I mean, he's the Tin Man too, right? And what's the Tin Man looking for? A heart. His heart. And Cornucopia's so, logo is the heart. And there's yeah. all kinds of cool little it's, tidbits in there. <laughs> it definitely rewards repeated readings, fantastically. So, oh, so I was gonna say when you said the highbrow thing, I was kind of shaking my head. I more meant that. I mean, there's a lot of this is a well crafted, intelligently written book, but I just it's incredibly accessible. Yes. It's like it's not like things aren't really hidden necessarily. You know what I mean? It's not you know. Yeah. I, I and just, even if you don't care about kind of any like. of if you don't even care about any of it, it's just a fun, violent, right. comedic romp. And it really, really is. It really does that. Um Alex said in an interview one time, like, I know it sounds like there's a lot uh, about to this story, but really it's if you like Robocop you'll like it. Because Robocop's yeah. one of those things where yeah. you can look really deep into it. Or you can just enjoy it on the surface for what it is as far as just pure entertainment value. Yeah. You know? Sure. This book has that as well. So he decides he's going to start robbing these stores, these cornucopia stores, right? And what happens is because of this new law where marketing is fair game, right, um, the manufacturer, and I love that that's the name of the corporation, is yeah. the manufacturer. And they're also, by the way, the cross yeah. With the, the sundial around it is their logo. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Also, Leo comes from a fundamentalist Christian upbringing. Yeah. And, and they, the very first thing you ever see is his his father basically losing the child because he's kind of being abusive to him. He just wants this action figure and action Joe. Yeah. And and he's got, you know, he's he's filled with all these stuff. And then later on you see that he's been adopted and his adoptive parents can't handle him. And he's like sitting there trying to get lightning out of his shoes because of something he saw in a commercial because he wasn't around this stuff. He was completely sheltered. So yeah. now he believes and buys into all the marketing, all the advertising. Yeah. And that's something really important to the character of Leo and how he represents common man. So the manufacturer sees that this is an opportunity for them to kind of make some money on this, get some notoriety. Um, they could recall the project. They know that something's malfunctioning with these with these glazed glasses, but they allow this to continue. Um, then even Cornucopia, not cool about it at first. So you got the two guys, the one that's in charge of the manufacturer, one that's in charge of Cornucopia. He sends this um, this badass assassin. What's his name? It's like Zajikik, the cremator. I don't know. It's like a Russian word for rabbit. That's why he wears those. Oh, is it? Okay. It's where he wears those little bunny yeah. ears, right? And also, if you notice in that one bit, what I would call Jerry's baptism of Leo in the beginning of the second issue, mm-hmm. there's a white rabbit that's following him. Oh. You know, if you mm. if you notice okay. there, um, really, and I, 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 by the way, 
you know, I used to put glue on my hands yes, and then like let it dry and, and, yeah. and peel it off. So anyway, so you got this assassin. He's being paid by Cornucopia to go and stop this because now Leo and Jerry are on this mad dash across the country robbing these stores. They're basically like Walmarts. They're called Cornucopia. They have yeah. the heart logo. Um, you know, the mecca of merch, you know, that's where we go find our hearts, but it's empty. It's not going to be there. Um, the cornfield uh, analogy you know, to the Dust Bowl and to Wizard of Oz and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, with Cornucopia, right? All that kind of stuff. It's all thrown in there. And and then basically Cornucopia is actually seeing a, like a 13% increase in their foot traffic because it becomes an internet show. Yeah. And they're be they've become huge hits. They even have a, an action figure yeah. made of himself as Leo is letting himself go. And one of my favorite things style-wise about the art in this book is that Leo and Jerry both get more and more decrepit oh, yeah. looking as the story goes. You know, yeah. Leo's gaining weight, he's looking unkempt, he's he looks unhealthy, and Jerry kind of does the some same thing. He's kind of like this parasitic, like mm -hmm. like a life sucking type thing. It's a very toxic bromance and it works so well. But it, then eventually it does come to a point where Cornucopia is like, we're gonna have to just on principle alone put an end to this. And the assassin comes in, but then there's this like fake Leo. Yeah. And Jerry that show up. And I remember the first time I read that issue, Brian. Yeah. I was so confused about who got shot yep. and what happened where. Oh, yeah. Um, And then it basically ends up with it like Leo gets shot. And and he's he's going he's dying, but he doesn't have to die. But now he just wants to go and find his Action Joe. Turns out Action Joe was was recalled because they're radioactive, and yeah. so they just buried them all underneath this like Native American land. Which mm -hmm. what, I mean, that's saying a lot right there, you know. Yeah. And it's poison the land, and then it comes back, and it's just this whole thing. He goes there, it catches on fire. Leo falls in there. We'll talk a little bit more about the ending. In a little bit. What do you want to say? You want to say well, something? I was going to say, like, the, uh, that, that was reminding me, too, of the, the government's role in all this, right? Yeah. Allowing these, you know, these unethical business practices yeah. and, uh, to go. Because that law is then interpreted to mean that anything that happens during this advertising is legal. And it like, is. So, so they don't so, get arrested. They yeah, can't. So what they're doing while it's advertising is fine, right? Yeah. And and then, like, you know, that the owner of Cornucopia, who is straight up an asshole. Rex um, Harrington? Yeah. The first time we see him, he's doing a literal manhunt. Yeah, he's doing that, uh, yeah, yeah, the greatest game or whatever. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, um, oh, Michael Douglas. But he's okay with his stores Douglas, getting robbed. Right? Uh, what was Michael Douglas in that movie? The most dangerous the game? game. But they made the movie. That's the game. That's different. But they made the movie. That that's, no, that's different. Is it different? I think that one's different. Okay. Yeah, but well, it's, whatever. It's okay. Well, when I read that short story, I always have Michael Douglas in my head. Well, that's probably good. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good. good <laughs> Why not? He would be great in that role. Michael Douglas um, should play Rex Harrington if they ever do, like a movie, a live action TV show or something. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I agree. But yeah, the um, you know the, uh, you know the uh, government's role in that was just like. Uh, Oh, I'm kind of blanking right now. Are you really yeah. Michael Douglas didn't distract you? Yeah, yeah, it did. Okay, okay. But I was going to say that, the, you know, because like you would talk about how that one owner was the, you know, the most dangerous game, but then the other one was a literal bloodsucker. Yes. Like he would actually hook employees up or people up and just take their blood. And too. steal their blood. And then at and the end there, the guy puts rat poison. Yeah. He's like eating <laughs> rat poison. So he kills him. And it's like, whoa. And it's just something yeah. so subtle and in the background mm -hmm. and just wild and weird. This yeah. book has a really fun vibrant, irreverent style mm -hmm. while it's saying some really, really oh. on the nose and very important yeah. things about modern society, I think. Yeah, that's what I, rem I remembered it about the government thing. Yeah. When they were talking about the Action Joe figures being buried yeah. in, the, in the desert, they tell, you know, because it, it reminds me of like how we look at things in the media and things like that because we, we get hot stories, right? Breaking news, yeah. right? And, and, you know, stories never last more than a week or two, right? And so like they were pointing out that like, it got national news that it was like killing these people and hurting all these people and everything like that. And so then Bill Clinton got involved because it was national news or whatever. Yeah. So they promised to do all these things about it. And then once it faded away, they, they went to yeah. Native American protected land and put it there. You know, and then they even I, didn't they have something where there was like some demonstrations about it and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, they, they did came, this big hoopla. They, they were like did a big press conference or we're going to yeah. clean up this land. We're going to get rid of yeah. these Action Joe figures. And then it cuts to five months later, and yeah, still there. They so, just yeah, yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, I mean that you know that happens. <laughs> so what do you think about the ending then? Let's go ahead and talk about it because the ending. I know a lot of people that really loved this book as it was going on. The ending kind of took them for a loop, took them for a curve. Me too. Yeah. I thought the natural way for this story to end was going to be Leo dying. Yeah. 
I think he gets something worse than death because he actually gets what he wants. But it, once again, it's tied into this idea of the, the fakeness yeah. of, of everything, the fakeness of the dream, that we won't actually achieve it. So he winds up being burnt up in this yeah. radioactive fire of action Joe dolls, right? Yeah. He sends his two, the the two, I can't remember what they're called, but they're the they're the drones that are following him and Jerry around. Yeah. I looked making up their the names, show. by the way. They're angels. Yeah. Yes. The, they're the watchers. Yeah, okay. From the Apocrypha. You know, so they're drones yes. watching everything, but those are the those are those the giants. Yes. The, those the are the seeds. characters that uh, Michael Sheen and David Tennant play in Good Omens. Oh, yeah. Just kidding. No. 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 I'm just, but I'm they were in uh, <laughs> Noah. That movie Noah. The one with uh, Russell Crowe? Yes. I never saw that. Yeah. Okay. You know, I remember the John Voight one that was like a made-for-TV one, I think. Hmm. Do you remember that one? No. No? It was like during those days of like Odyssey and Merlin and every year NBC or someone, they they did some kind of big fantasy epic. Anyway, they should do yeah. Friendo next time. It'd they be a should. great, delightful they network should. made for TV movie. Um, <laughs> um, what about the ending, though? Because basically what happens, he gets burnt up. And when this happens, Leo merges with Jerry, basically. Right. Jerry, once again, for the third time, saves him. Yeah. Right? So he covers him up. He makes him think that he's like in this ocean of, of advertising and marketing. And then he comes up and he's he's action Joe. Yeah. He's literally what he's always wanted. Because the whole book starts about a kid who wanted an action figure. And right. I think one of the tags they even say in the back of the book is that Leo wasn't allowed to have toys as a kid. Now he's all grown up and he's going to take yours. You know? Yeah. And I love that stuff. And I love the new Treat Yourself. Treat Yourself. You know, yep. treat yourself. You definitely need to treat yourself by buying that book. Yeah. Um, but the ending is a little weird because... You don't quite get what's going on. Then all of a sudden, Leo, at the end of this, he becomes a celebrity. Yeah. He becomes a star. He yeah. gets what he wants. Meanwhile, it's his horrible, hideous thing. Yeah. But Jerry's not allowing him to see that. Right. He's yeah. Now that he's merged and he's kind of... Because Jerry's this hologram, basically, that he sees through his glasses. Yeah. He now sees himself through these glasses. He, he never takes them off. It's yeah. a good thing to talk about the way technology has risen. Yeah. And has almost risen too fast. It's definitely risen beyond most of society's ability to keep up with that technology. Right. You know? I don't know. Yeah. What do you think about the end? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's this, it basically looks like a, you know, plastic amorphous blob. You yeah. Know? And then, uh, and it's like, yeah, he's fully, now the he's. The glasses are like melted into his face. Yeah. And you don't even get the full on look of it. No. Really. Yeah. Yeah. It, you get enough though. <laughs> yeah. I, I say. yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, he's like, uh, Jerry has gotten him fully immersed in the delusion. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, there's no bones about it. There's nothing, you know, you know, no, no trying to, you know, just end it all and all these other things. You know, it's just he's just fully in this delusion that he's, you know, everything's OK. Yeah. Everything's happy and all this other stuff. And it's yeah, it was. Yeah, I was I really fully thought he was just dead. Right. Yeah. You know, and then they say he's going to be on the show. And I'm like, wait, what? You yeah. Know? Right. So, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a I mean, it's a I don't know. Looking back at it now, it's a logical conclusion. Now, yeah, you know, for that story. Yeah, I mean, because it, it does. He he gets what he wants, but it's still it's false. It's fake. Yeah. It's not real. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. he's. Most people would have been happy with, you know, a rich partner that was able to to help them through life, to, uh, try to chase their dreams and live. You know, and even in this, and what's crazy is it's it's it gets labeled even by some of the creators as a like a like a futuristic dystopian science fiction. Mm -hmm. Man, it is not that far off from where it's not we that are. Futuristic. No, it is like <laughs> it's like five years from now, man. Yeah. I don't know, man. It seems pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, it's set in L.A. Of course, we as Americans know that L.A. is all that rep is completely represents everything, fake and phony and and false dreams and and having the world just keep knocking you down and stuff like that. Um, you get this idea in the story. And the very first thing you see is actually a quote from T.S. Eliot talking about deserts mm -hmm. talking about how like, you know, the desert and your friend's heart or soul or mind or something like that. There's a lot of references to deserts. And Alex Packendale in an interview said that he said it in L.A. because it always fascinated him. And somebody had said this, and I don't remember who he said it was, but that L.A. is this dichotomous state in a way of, of dreams and reality. He goes, mm -hmm. I can't think of another place where you have so much excess right next to people yeah. who can't. So much abject poverty, right? Yeah, and people cannot be a part of that, right? Yeah. And I think that's some of those, that interaction that Leo has with that first homeless guy, the guy that comes at him, that he's yeah. mistaken for his father yeah. at first, right? And that interaction says a lot. But he said that there was this, somebody had said something like, L.A. is that town that can't decide if it's a beach or a desert. 
God. And that's something that a dude even says in the book. How chilling is that moment? I don't know if it's this bit. It might be. But when he drives by in the midst of this, like, road movie, and that's what it becomes. It becomes this, yeah. like, toxic bromance road movie filled with, with just riotous violence and laughter and just ridiculousness and and lots of of irreverent, like, commentary, mm-hmm. uh, scathing commentary on society. But he, he passes someone who does what he used to do. Yeah. And he's, like, burnt up or whatever, you yeah, know. Yeah, the and, fake Fast and the Furious yeah, title. I can't yeah. remember what it was. But the it was Swift awesome. and the something or something, yeah. like, uh, something like that. Right. But I absolutely loved it. Um, well, that's where he says, uh, there's no place like home. He does. Actually. And yeah. I was, like, I was, because I did want to bring that up. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you brought it up because, like, I was trying to think, what is his concept of home? Yeah. Like, I mean, because his dad was like, it was, he was a fundamentalist, but I mean, he was a street preacher, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, he was a, he was the type of person that was accosting people on Venice beach as if they're going to care about his message, you know, because, and, and just straight up abandoned him. He, you know, I mean, he left, he left his son there. Yeah. You know, that's how, like his, you know, that's how Leo ended up in the system. Yeah. So I was like, I was like trying to figure out like what, what could his concept of home be? What is it? Because it's not, it's not his relationship. Yeah, it, has, it seems to me like throughout the book, it's it's that that damn action Joe, almost yeah. in a way, and he's he's been wanting uh, a father figure for the longest time. Yeah, and yeah. that's what that's what Jerry fits. Yeah, because that's a good point. You were saying that like he thought that uh, the bum was his father. I forgot that you know, mm-hmm. and then Jerry, you know, then you know that stuff happens. He gets fused, and then Jerry basically steps in. Yeah, you know, as that. Yeah, wow. he saved my life. He, you know, yeah. he looks out for me. My yeah. douchebag friends didn't. They just left me there. Well, that's not really the full picture. Yeah, they got separated in this crazy storm because they're worried about their friends who's having an asthma attack. Yeah, in the midst of this giant dust cloud. You know, we're talking about the Wizard of Oz stuff, and this is part of Styles, the way they chose to bring its stuff in. Now, until I read this interview, I didn't know about the Steinbeck stuff whatsoever. Yeah. Now, apparently, Steinbeck and Baum. Has some similar ideas as far as, as story structure and, and and story theme and stuff like that, but looking at I mean as this book was coming out, I remember me and you. I, at one point, I tweeted out to something like I'm loving Friendo. I feel like I'm not quite getting everything, but I can't wait to see how it goes. And I think it was Adrian that said, "Here's a hint: we're off to see the wizard." Ah. And that's when I started noticing it is so freaking obvious in this book from the beginning him and his fellow dancers are dressed up as characters from the wizard of oz yeah there's a kim mclean variant cover for issue number three where he's like going down an alleyway or something or buildings and there's a rainbow and the rain's Uh, falling in rainbow colors yeah there's the no place like home line yeah there's the fact that when he's trying to commit suicide in the middle of all this crazy you know internet show that he's got going on he's wearing ruby slippers yeah, Do you know that's what I'm true. saying. That's true. This isn't a sex thing. You let them know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kinky. No, yeah. What is it? Not kinky, just sad. Yeah, not kinky, just sad. And yeah. God, does that say so much? It's so sad. Yeah, it really is. Leo is a character that he's the protagonist. He's a he's a dickhole. He's yeah. a, he's not a good dude. Yeah. But none of us really are. Yeah. Like really, come on. Well, we all yeah. got mo- well. You're fantastic. Right, but we all got moments, right? Um, but Leo is a is a relatable character, I think, because, you know, like I'm saying, I'm guilty. You know, I I got called out many times on this channel when I would talk about how much I loved Friendo. People were like, yeah, he chills for a book about consumerism. Meanwhile, he's, you know, he's all over, you know, he's consumed by consumerism. Well, yeah, we all are. That's the point of this book. Do you yeah. think Alex thinks that he's above it, or is he making a commentary on our society? You know, right. You know, I don't know. So let's talk about the art real quick because we're talking a lot about Alex, his themes and the writing and the pace. Martin Simmons, this book wouldn't work without him. This book is right. amazing. He did work on things like um, Punk's Not Dead. Did you read that one? You ever read Punk's Not Dead? I, I'm i familiar with it. I haven't read it. It's the one yeah. where Sid Barrett's ghost haunts this kid. I need to read it. It's pretty fun. Yeah, it's I pretty need to read fun. That. Yeah, I yeah. haven't read the second volume of that yet called London Calling. Oh. Um, but I really, really should. Just in the fact that they named it after like one of my favorite albums of all time. Yes. London Calling by The Clash, in case you didn't know. But Martin Simmons um, did a different style. He didn't color it. D. Kniff came in. Uh, Kniff colors uh, Redneck for Donny Cates oh. and Lissandro Etherin. Uh, a fantastic uh, southern fried vampire book that's fantastic. Um, D's colors for this... I want to make a D's nuts joke so bad when I, I said that. I, I was wondering if these colors to. are so amazing in this too, and they add in along with the the simple clean line work. And Simmons said that he was inspired by people like Massa Kelly, yeah. 
Yeah. He was trying to mm -hmm. simplify his line work. He's trying to make it look fake. He's like, you don't notice many logos. You see the cornucopia logo. You see his minimalistic corporate logos. Um, but for the most part, he wanted L.A. He wanted the world of Frendo to look fake, plastic. The colors go into effect with that. Apparently, Alex told D he wanted every scene to be colored, the color palette to be like some kind of weird, cheesy, sickly sweet drink that you would get at a L.A. bar or something like that. It makes yeah. sense. It feels fake. It feels like what Miami is. It feels like the way Miami and L.A. are targeted at us, especially back in the 80s. Like, yeah, it's yeah. got the color palette True. of Miami Vice, man. Yeah, yeah. It's like, is Michael Mann should do this movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but I absolutely love it. The coloring in conjunction with the art, it's bleak, it's plastic, it's sickly sweet and fake. Um, and then you've got Taylor Esposito, one of the best letterers in the business. Absolutely, yeah. we, we talk about um, Hassan, we talk about Aditya. Taylor's right up there with it. Like, okay. I love this cat's lettering and the way that... He doesn't put hard borders over the lettering bubbles, over the mm -hmm. word balloons. I really, really like that. It adds to this fake feeling to me yep. of the book and the way it flows. What do you think about the style, the artwork, all that stuff? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely loved it. Uh, there's a, 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 I'll bring up a couple of different things. Like yeah. on the colors, Please do. Uh, you know, when you, you know, mentioned the cocktail thing, that that's awesome. That, uh, as soon as you described that, I was like, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. That, that's very accurate. Looks like um, a sunset on the beach <laughs> and, uh, or the desert. This time when I was reading it, I was just like, yeah, I mean, a lot of it's bleak and plastic looking, but one of the things I noticed is that it's, it's like really chunky. Yeah. Like there's like, everything's in kind of bigger blocks of colors, which would make something look more plastic. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, it's more uniform colors and everything like that, but, it, but you know, there was like a lot of contrasting colors. So like they really jumped out at you. Yes. A lot of the time. Like, it was like there were so many pages where it was jumping out at me. It was just, it was great. Um, and then, uh, there's a couple of moments in the art. I thought the art throughout was, was brilliant and consistent. And like, you know, the, you know, the motifs in there, you know, yeah, it was, it was minimalist, but you know, like, you know, his glasses were broken with that logo yeah. of the company. I mean, there was like motifs all throughout it that were, you know, that were great. But, uh, earlier when I mentioned when he, uh, you know, after he shocked and, uh, you know, at the beginning of issue two, the panels going across the top uh, of the sun kind of coming in and being reflected in the eyes and everything like that. Just like everything was so striking in those. Like I just like that, that just that page popped out at me. And then but I think my favorite, at least I guess it's two pages in a row, is where he's uh, where Leo is in the backyard playing, trying to get the lightning in his shoes. Yes. Um that you were mentioning earlier. Do you notice, and, by the way, in, when he's trying to kill himself and he's wearing the ruby red slippers, that's, that's the middle panel. Oh, is that what you're getting yeah, to? Yeah, that's what I was yeah. getting to, Oh, man, my bad. you know okay. I was going to bring up the nine-panel grid. Yeah, yeah. It uh, might be the, I think that there might be another nine-panel grid in the book, but it, I think it's the only might one be the I only remember one. that stood out, for yeah. sure. And But yeah, that middle panel, like, it shows his feet and you can tell it's somebody trying to kill themselves in a bathroom. It's obvious, right? And then, like, in that middle panel, the lightning actually strikes. And yeah. then his legs are off. And you're like, oh, man. It was like, I, I don't know. That one was... that. Excellent use of the nine panel grid. Yeah, like, you know thought, Brian is amazing. Brian loves the nine panel grid and the effective use of the middle panel. Yes, and that's definitely an effective use. So another thing I really like about Martin's artwork, he was influenced by this book by corporate design. He says that he doesn't like it how minimalist everything has gone. Mm -hmm. He thinks it all comes from that the Apple logo, right? Yeah, where like that's all you need is this one image, and if you look, that's what everything is. Now, if you take the idea of of sigils and stuff like that, it makes sense. You know that, like, to simplify the image, yeah. to 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 hold a maximum level concept. Like, the, all you need are some golden M, is a golden yeah. M, and we're all thinking McDonald's. And yeah. even though I haven't had McDonald's in years, yeah. right now I'm wanting some of their Coca Cola because they got a yeah. different Coca Cola. I'm telling you that. Yeah. Um, but I love the also Martin's his perspective. He chooses camera angles if you would, that most artists wouldn't yeah. choose. Yeah. And, you know, when you mention the nine-panel grid, what makes that stand out so much is that this book is very open and mm -hmm. spacious and expansive and an excellent use of the double-page spread yeah. throughout this book. And I absolutely love it. But it's got a lot of room to breathe. It mm -hmm. opens up that space to have those big blocks of color with the, still some nice, like, great detail of, like, brush strokes or, like, sh slight shading and texture that uh that D kind of brings to it um that really help the the lettering by Esposito glide across that page. It's just such a masterfully composed book. Yeah. And it makes that scene in particular stand out. Yeah. 
Yeah, because uh, like leading up to it is where the that woman, the his adoptive mother, is talking, you know, to that woman, and it's like it's the wide widescreen panels again, yeah, you know, in the back, and it has I think my favorite line in there because she's basically, you know, telling this person that she's giving the kid up because she just can't handle it effectively. And then I uh, said, it's, you know, he's going back in the, in, you know, in the system. And then you flip over and, 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 you know, in the balloon telling you that it's not, you know, off panel or whatever. You yeah. know, it says, I mean, it's America. What's the worst that could happen? I know, right? I was like, crap. Oh. Yeah. Because, oh. you know. <laughs> so let's talk about what this joke. book is actually about beneath the surface. And you don't have to dig too far, but the further you dig, the more you're going to find. In fact, you just might find... I don't know, hundreds of thousands of Action Joes being irradiated. That's another thing that's really funny is Leo, when he was a kid, I noticed this when I reread it today. This was probably, I mean, I read these books over and over again because I was doing advanced reviews. I was reading yeah. it for the weekly yeah. review. I would I would reread the books that came before getting ready for the next one because I love stuff that challenges me, that makes me think, right? And, and this is definitely a book that does that. All of Alex's work does this for me. Um, it's one of the reasons why I love it so much. Um, but... He, his desire to have this action Joe, and he doesn't even want his dad to buy it. He saved up yeah. his money, and his dad's throwing all the stuff like, you know, money is, is an illusion. It's not real. It's not going to make you happy. Dude, he's telling him the truth. But that he obviously is. ain't the, you know what I'm saying? But that's, that's yeah. a great dichotomy there because that's yeah. not the way either. And yeah. it doesn't really go too far much into, like, I think, like religious, like fundamentalism or mm -hmm. anything like that, but it has its place there as a starting point. But then I think the idea is that it's the market that has taken over the place of religion right. in today's culture. Yeah. Right? And I think that's why the manufacturer has the cross as their logo. Oh, yeah. And then even the heart. Yeah, we can tie it in with the Tin Man, but it's also – the heart is also a religious symbol, especially in yeah. Catholicism. Oh, yeah. You always see Jesus with that heart. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And right. that's there. And I think I – I read a lot of Alex Packendale interviews this afternoon, and I think he even mentioned that in one of them, that like there was this idea that the market was going to replace religion as what bound people together. People would get their spiritual connection through yeah. commerce. and Yeah, right? And, and so that, one of the things, and, and fill that hole. Alex said that to him what this book was about, and this makes a lot of sense to me, because we know the capitalism, the consumerism, late stage capitalism, what happens when it starts breaking? Yeah. This is what Alex is trying to explore. Like, we may be hitting a tipping point now where we, like, some of us may think that, right? Yeah. But what happens when you actually do? And he's like, we've hit this disparity now where corporations have gotten so good at marketing and selling the need for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they've gotten so good at making fun, vibrant, shiny plastic things, right? Yeah. But meanwhile, most of society they're they have they're starting to have more and more of a lack of resources. They can't even afford this stuff. And that's why he was right. talking about LA was so fascinating to him because you had this shiny, glamorous life right next to this dude that's been sleeping on this park bench for ten years. You mm -hmm. know, that's just sitting there drinking cheap modello all the time or something like that, right? And it's a really weird situation that we're in. He goes, What happens when it breaks? And it snaps off. Of course, you got the Wizard of Oz connection. The idea, he said, that we're, we're, we're sold this dream. He leaves the Midwest and goes to this fantasy land of L.A. to get his dream. And what happens? He looks behind the curtain. There's no wizard at all. It's just yeah. a dude pushing buttons. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, he does get what he wants. He does literally become the plastic action figure yeah. at the end, which I actually love. Um, marketing and the ability to purchase getting far away. We got this illusion of yeah. plenty in our society right now. And I think that's mm -hmm. what the book's tackling. What do you think about some of those or just what, what, what do you pull from this book? Yeah. It's like the, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, one of the things I was uh, mentioning to you earlier, you know, is like just that omnipresent advertising, you know, I mean, yeah. that, like we're getting that again, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, um, you know, I, I, cause I remember when cable first came out, that's how old I am, you know, is that, uh, you know, part of that sale sales pitch for cable is that we wouldn't have to watch commercials anymore because we're paying for this product. Yeah. Well, then it's like, they just start throwing ads in there and nobody's seen to complain. So like you just start getting the ads everywhere, you know? And, uh, there are um, ads in front of movies I mean, now. I we're both old enough to remember when there weren't ads. Oh yeah, before movies, except for trailers for other movies. Right, right. Yeah, that was it. That was it. Yeah, it's and uh, I mean, yeah, it's like uh, you know, I mean, I, I know there's some subscription services without them and things like that, but I mean, yeah, it's just it's everywhere, you know. And this one, you know, and this it just puts it out in the open, you know, where I mean, they're they're 
they're actually demonstrating things to get on the news. Yeah. So that's advertising too, you know, I mean, it's, uh, that, you know, that is definitely, you know, definitely a part of our culture now. And, uh, yeah, it's like the, and how invasive I, that advertising and marketing yeah. is now, like through yeah. things like Facebook and, you know, we've had the links and, and Google and, and there like, there's yeah. that moment where Leo's lover at the time even said, cause he says something like, Jerry's the only person I got. He knows everything about me. And she's like, of course. Yeah. He has access to your entire online history. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's the psychology of this stuff, you know, right. I mean, cause that's why they've gotten so good at it, you know, as they actually understand the psychology of how, you know, people will react to, you know, different things and they're, they're, you know, they're becoming masters of holding your attention. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, even, you know, even smart people, you know, think that, you know, they're not going to get fooled or anything like that. You know, these tricks work, you know, they do work stuff like that. So, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, all they got to do is put a new power ranger you know? action figure out and I'm, I'm buying it. Why? Right. Why Brian? Why right. Right. is my life better because of an action figure? Maybe momentarily, no, momentarily. It's yeah. all fake though. That's the thing. Yeah. But that, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the psychology behind that is like, you know, it's the pursuit usually of these things that is actually more rewarding. It's once you get that stuff that. And yeah, what happens when Leo finally gets his action gel? It's, he's, he's, the illusion is, is false to him now. He's like, I don't want this. Yeah. Why did I ever think this would have been the answer? You right. know, and it's not, you know, and that's the one thing I did. What I was, I got to this and I got distracted, but when he's a kid and his father leaves him, he blames it on his will, his desire for that action right. gel, even though he had the money to do it. Yeah. He wasn't asking the dude to buy it. But he says it, and I caught this so or so early in the book. He goes, I dropped it as if it was radioactive to the touch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting there. Yeah. 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 Any other thoughts on themes and what the book means? Well, uh, I was going to, um, you know, early, very early in this video, you mentioned uh, fake plastic trees. Yes. Which reminded me of Radiohead. Huh, go figure. And um, issue number four, I think, is called uh, The Crackle of Pigskin, which is a lyric from Paranoid Android. Is it? I, is, I was wondering what that was representing, what which, that meant. Which is a very dystopian song. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, it's one of my all-time favorite Radiohead songs. I mean, it's, uh, you know, because it, I don't know, I just thought it was a, a great inclusion in this because it that that song is perfect for this because it's paranoid android too right? yeah and you know it's i mean it's all the technology in there um and uh fits the motif perfectly and everything like that but um and you know you shouldn't i mean if you can include radiohead you should you should always you know? i mean include radiohead it's good stuff i'm surprised uh, i'm 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 not near as clever as alex martin and company <laughs> had i written this book seriously like I would have named a chapter Fake Plastic Dreams. Yeah, <laughs> I just straight go. up would have done it. Um, straight up. What's the importance of the book? Well, obviously Vault Comics, a big company that's on the rise, a big small company, if you will, yeah. doing great science fiction and fantasy. And I really think that Frendo, Deep Roots, The Savage Shores, Fearscape, The White Noise Crew, Fearscape. I think that The White Noise Cats are the most talented writers in comic books right now. I love them. I think they're absolutely fantastic. When they made this deal with Vault, it gave Vault a series of consecutive major hits, yeah. right? That were critically acclaimed and also, I think, sold pretty well for them, right? These yeah. Savage Shorts just wrapped up. We are now done with Wave 1. There is a Wave 2 that's been announced. White Noise is coming back doing more stuff with them. Very excited for that. What are you, what are you itching to say? Well, I just... I, <laughs> you said you're very excited. I am too. Like, yeah. Because, like, you know... Uh, you know, covered Frendo, you mentioned D Savage Shores, Deep Roots, and Fearscape. Oh, yeah. Fearscape, I know, you know is one you of your know my loves. Yeah. But Fearscape. But at the same time, like, I, when I read Deep Roots, man, I was like, holy crap. And that was this the thing first is one. Awesome. I mean, and it's like, I mean, it, you know, it's a dystopian one as well, but like, the colors in that, I mean, it, these are comics that have things that you don't see. The Triona like, Farrell colored that one, yeah. right? And Val Rodriguez did the artwork. Right. The line right. Work. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and these Savage Shores, like, I mean, I was confused reading that one for a little bit, uh -huh. you know, because I, I just, these, I couldn't fit these, these Savage, Savage Shores, Shores okay. not because, like, I just wasn't sure what, where it was going, I guess, you know, yeah. but I guess my point is, like, all four of those, to me, were just hits. Yeah. Mentally. Because, like, like, I read them, and when I put them down, I was like, man, I know I'm going to yeah. be reading that. Ball, I know I'm going to be rereading yeah, that. Vault was already right? getting you know? our attention. Yeah. They were getting our attention. Submerged. Um, Maxwell's Demons, for sure. Um, yeah. Heathen, they were getting our attention 
But for me, it was Deep Roots, Frendo, Fearscape, these Savage Shores, where I was like, there's something going on here. Yeah. I mean, like, I remember every issue of Fearscape when it came out. Like, I couldn't wait to, to Wednesday to see you again. Yeah. I mean, that's, I know, like, right? I Me like, too. Like, I can't wait to talk to you. We're going to talk. How know? do you and think I like... felt selling you the comic book on Wednesday? <laughs> just wanting to You've talk You've already about read it. it, right? You're like, hmm. I'm like, yeah. I, I need to talk to, I need to talk to Brian about this because I know he's read Ulysses. <laughs> like, <Yep. laughs> I know yep. he's read this stuff. Um, leads me to go ahead and say we love White Noise so much that in season yep. three of Comics Revisited, we're going to do, we've already talked about doing The Savage Shores. Right. Which just wrapped up. Fearscape for sure. Yeah. Let's go ahead and just throw Deep Roots in there as I well. I think we should. Why not? We should. Because Dan Watt and, and all of these cats, they're four super cool cats, okay? They are literally some of the nicest, most warm people I've ever had the chance to interact with. And they are all just upstanding. Upstanding gentlemen. And really smart, very creative. And you can just imagine that them is supporting each other in this way with this White Noise studio just makes them better. You yep. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It just makes them better. The collective is better than the, the sum of its parts, in a way. Right. And and it's just... But they each have their own flair. Like, you're not going to mistake Alex Pagandel's Friendo for being written by Ron V or Dan right. Waters, you know? And they're all right. having a lot of success right now um, as a result of their work at, at, at Vault and, of course, their work otherwise. Like, they've done work at Image. They've done work at Titan. Stuff like that. Ron V, of course, just wrapped up these Savage Shores. Alex Pagandel's writing Kino right now for Catalyst Prime. He wrote the Incursion series over at Valiant, so he's getting some more work. Um, like I said, they re-upped with Vault. Dan Waters is over doing Lucifer for Vertigo right now. However, is he doing Coffin Bound? He does do Coffin yeah. Bound, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's another yeah. White Noise okay. um, production. Fantastic stuff. Ryan O'Sullivan working hard on Fearscape 2, I believe. I don't know. Oh, Have you ever read Boy Trip or Limbo or any of the Paradiso or any of those other ones uh -uh. that they did back in the day? Oh, so Everything I've read from these casters is so good. But okay. seriously, like... I won't take notes right now, but I'm going to yeah, take notes yeah. here in a little bit. Alex's work <laughs> is amazing. He's got, a, he's got a brilliant career ahead of him. Like I said, check out Kino that's going on right now. But definitely read Arcadia and Turncoat and Frendo. To me, just... I don't know if there are three better, more perfect sci-fi books out than that, right? But I don't know. And what I hope... And this book just wrapped up this year. So we can't really talk too much about the lasting legacy of Frendo yet, but what I hope will be the lasting legacy is a series of incredibly intelligent and nuanced and layered books that are yeah. also incredibly fun. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's... And this book is also fun. We may have painted this book as being pretty heavy, but it's not. This book is yeah. super fun, and it's such a thrill ride. Yeah, there are definite, definite bust-out laugh, you know, bust laughing moments. Yes. To, I, mean, this, I mean, of course, they're kind of dark, Yep, but like yeah. I, I just you know I mean the first time they that he they hold up one of the cornucopias, man, I was I was crying, I was laughing so yeah, hard right? how botched that oh whole that's thing was. so funny, and, uh, and uh, Taylor's lettering that was awesome. Yes, by the way, um, uh, but yeah, it was like one thing you were mentioning earlier is about how you know cool and great these guys are. It's like you know I think I think it was Maxwell's Demons video where I was mentioning how excited I am to be a comics reader, especially today, because mm -hmm. like we've just got we've got a lot of good stuff. You know, I mean, there's just so much stuff coming out uh, every week. But, you know, uh, a lot of folks are active on Twitter in the comic book world. And um, it's like, I don't know. Uh, to me, I wonder if it's like a higher percentage in the comic book world of how seriously cool and genuine and nice people are in the comic book world as an industry. Yeah, right. I mean, I like, you know, I don't know. I just, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, you interact with them, you know. Fair bit more than I do. Uh, They're but, all I mean, fantastic like, dudes, and I you you and wouldn't expect that. It's from awesome. Them. Yeah, because like you know, I remember growing up and things like that. There's that common phrase, you know, you never want to meet your heroes. I'm like, well, I have, and you know, a lot of these cases, and I'm okay. Yeah, like it, it was a it was a great experience actually. Like, yeah, more than okay. So, I don't know. I just like, I don't know. It's it's a great time to be a comic book reader. I I mean, yeah. Yeah, Alex and the rest of the White Noise crew have been nothing but upstanding dudes to me and my interactions with them. And I cannot wait to personally meet them face to face. Yeah. Like we've we got going? to get to a New York comic con or a C2 E2 or an Emerald city or something like that. Yeah. We've got to or thought bubble. 
we're gonna go <laughs> over <laughs> to I don't know, let's just go to England. You yes. know what I'm saying? Let's just we go. Should. Let's we just should. let's go let's go find them one day, you know. We're gonna stalk their Twitter and be like, Oh, they're at the pub right now. Let's yep. go over there, right? Yep. I don't know. Also, and I know that this is Alex's book, but Rom has the most lustrous head of comic book hair I've ever yeah. I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. He makes Brooks jealous. Does he really? Especially because Brooks cut it. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, that's what we think about Frendo. Let us know what you think about Frendo in the comments down below. We really do appreciate you checking out this episode of Comics Revisited. Join us next time where we're going to be talking about Planetary. That's right, me and Jelani talking about the entirety of Planetary. And don't worry, Brian's just as jealous as you are for not being a part of that video. However, lots of excitement. So thank you guys so much. Let us know, like I said, what you think about Frendo. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at Pop Culture Philosophers. Dot com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been rocking Robbie Billups. This has been Brian Weaver. And I can talk for a long time about Batman Planetary. And I'm not yet brought to you by Disney. We are pop culture philosophers. <laughs> you dig? What am I supposed to say? Oh, Kramer. I thought it was Umbrellas. That was season one. It's been Kramer this season. Has it? Yeah, it's been Kramer because it's a picture of Kramer. Oh, there's Kramer. Yeah. That's. I get it now.